Welcome to everyone for coming. Um, we're glad to host you for our February programs. This is the first of four programs that we will be doing this month. Um, and it's just a great turnout. We've had to turn people away, so we're going to do a second. Rogers offered to do a second program at 2.30, so we'll get, get that going as well. And Dwayne is also recording these, so they're going to be available on YouTube within the, our YouTube channel within the next couple of days. So people that hadn't, hadn't been able to see will then be able to see. Um, so this is the 45th year of February history programs here at the Courthouse, which is pretty amazing. And um, we have Carl to thank for that. <laughs> it over to Carl. Well, a few other people were in on the uh, early days, but I, I'm the antique that's still around from those earliest days. <laughs> yeah, it's been a good run. Uh, so, cell phones, uh, put them on silence, turn them off, please. Uh, we, uh, we do raise funds during these uh, October events, and uh, one of the ways is by uh, Memberships and the desk downstairs, there would be somebody there very happy to sign you up as a member. The other thing we do uh, at these programs is send the sock around. And uh, if you'd like to make a contribution, uh, those are much appreciated and uh, helps to keep the doors open here and uh, keep these programs going. Uh, Stephanie. Stephanie, are you downstairs? She has extra raffle tickets, and uh, this will be the last chance to buy extra raffle tickets. Um, I'm not sure if she'll be up here before. If she is, she will have some to sell. Anyways, uh, uh, the raffle, uh, we have a number of things uh, that will be raffled today. and. Uh, that's another way we raise a little bit of money to keep the doors open here. Uh, Roger Nichols has uh, donated a, a silver dollar that will be uh, that will be uh, raffled today. Uh, Sherry Mumford has contributed a nice bottle of wine with a cozy to go with it on the little table here. Um, uh, Sheila Dooley is one of our board members, and uh, she and uh, Chris Bolton, our docent, have uh, developed some coasters. Now. We have some of them uh, that will be part of the raffle today. There are some other things that will be uh, up in coming weeks. Uh, one is this book that I put together. It will be uh, actually, uh, it's been around for a couple months, but we're going to have a book launch on the, on the 16th over at the Art Center. And this is the follow up to the first. Altogether, the Dow's book that the Art Center put together, and I did some writing for that, and this one I put together, and we have some for sale downstairs, but there will be some on the raffle uh, in some of the subsequent weeks. And then also Stephanie Rickert, one of our board, board members, is donating a, a night's uh, stay on at her children's program in Corbett, Old McDonald's Farm, stay for two people, cottage there in the farm, so that's uh, something that would be, uh, would happen next summer. So, uh, that, that's the raffle. Um, I guess the only other thing is uh, introducing our speaker who needs no introduction. Uh, Roger, uh, of course, uh, I think everybody here will remember uh, wrote for the Chronicle for a number of years, did the history of mystery and those history pages that uh, taught us all so much about uh, what went on in this community in, in days gone by. Uh, he's been a, a radio personality. He is writing now for the Rural Light. He is a longtime board member here at the original courthouse, and he has done several programs before. And I invite you to welcome Roger. Okay, everybody hearing me okay? Everything okay downstairs? 
Don't hear anything? Okay, let's go on with it. Well, I'm along with this. I'm one of those people that like to oops, wait a minute. Don't touch anything. See if this will work. I like to thank people at the beginning when people are still paying attention. <laughs> So it, about this list, Art Babbitts is at the Hood River County Historical Museum that got me started finding the early, some of the earliest uh, photographs of the island. Um, and uh, Wasco County Assessor Jill Amory helped find a history of ownership. Ryan Griffin of the BLM Prineville office shared some homestead information. And Leninger, who provided important Mosier connections, the late Pat Patricia Crusoe, whose uh, book from Akidaki to Zoomorphic, an encyclopedia about Hood River County, had a fascinating entry on the subject we'll be talking about. Late Willis Golston, former Mosher postmaster and former owner of the island, who for 43 years ago in this room made a presentation on Mosher history and talked a bit about Chicken Charlie's Island as well. His daughter, and I'm not sure if it's Jeannie or Jean Reeves, who passed on my inquiry to her sister, Marilyn Golston Shaw, who provided huge quantities of documents and photos concerning the island including a series of photos taken by their other sister, Molly Golston, and Paul and Joe Childs, the current owners of the island, had a lovely talk with them, and my patient and supportive wife, Julie Reynolds. So thank you all. So our plan today is we've got four parts to it. One is the history before Charlie. One is Charlie's tenure in the island, the day after Charlie, and then we are very fortunate to have a number of photos taken on the island, inside the house, and above the house. So you're going to get a tour at the very end. So stick around for that. And then afterwards, if you're wondering why all these books about money are up here, I did offer I, one of the things that I do is I uh, do evaluations of uh, states of coins and currency for the lawyers in town. So I thought if anybody thought anything interesting or had some questions, I'd give them a free evaluation today. So let's begin. And that, believe it or not, that's an Oregon Department of Transportation hand-drawn map showing the fact that there was, the island was considerably larger back in the day and had this big sandbar at a little rocky island to the west of it there. The official name on uh, government maps is 18 Mile Island. And why? Well, because it's 18 miles west. Oops, there's a, one that I didn't get to. Okay, okay. I'm sorry. That's, I want to show you the sandbar there in that picture, too. This is the actual real picture of that. Um, and the reason it's uh, 18 uh, Mile Island is 18 miles west of Big Eddy, and that's Big Eddy there, which was at the foot of, just over here would be the entrance to the Salilo Canal. That was quite a landmark, and that's where they, they measured from. And I don't know if it's 18 nautical miles or 18 miles, but somebody with a boat can check that out. Um, let's see. You know, it may come as a surprise. You notice at the beginning I put the word chicken in quotation marks because Chicken Charlie did not raise chickens on the island. <laughs> there were chickens on the island before Chicken Charlie, and we'll get to that. And, and uh, we'll get back to Charlie in particular. First, let's go back in history. And interestingly, there is no evidence of uh, native permanent occupation on the island before Lewis and Clark. There's only been a few artifacts, scattered artifacts. Um, and Lewis and Clark did mention it in their journal. That's the mention. A point of rocks island in a lard or leeward bend. That's the mention. They were much more interested in Memelus, the sarcophagus island, because of all the burials that were done, open air burials by the tribes. And this, unfortunately, was scavenged by many people over the years because they would bury the people with their artifacts and people would come and dig for those. And that monument there is for Victor Trevitt, who was supposedly a great friend of the Indians and asked to be buried with them. And uh, yeah, it's just unfortunate. And there was also, by the way, an upper Memelos Island, which also was used that way, but it was covered uh, by the uh, Lake Salilo behind the Dallas Dam. This is the earliest photo we have recorded of people dwelling on the island. It dates from 1904. And uh, the first record we have of somebody living on the island comes from a memoir written by 
Lenora Hunter, she came to Mosier in 1894 at the age of 17, and later served as postmistress for the town of Mosier. And she remembered that there was a couple living on the island that she couldn't remember their names, only that they were very short people, under five feet, and the woman had a treadle sewing machine, and she sewed clothing for girls, infants, and dolls, and her husband rode them to shore and sold them locally. Um, but uh, the winter of 1894-95 was particularly harsh. Uh, they were marooned on the island because the ice in the river was too thick to row through, and they were too, were too thin to walk on, and they left the following spring. Now, that's not the island. That is actually a picture of that winter in the Dalles at the train station, as close as I could come to that. Well, somewhere around 1903, a chicken rancher named Holmgate owned a chicken farm on Mill Creek. That's not his farm, it's just a Mill Creek farm of the, in, of the era. And he was losing a lot of money because he was being eaten out of business by the coyotes, bobcats, and raccoons. So he said, hey, let's build a moat around it by putting them out on the island. Raising chickens on the island would keep the predators away, so he hired a couple named Ray and Lola Bailey to live on the island to build the chicken coops. And you can see, you can see a couple of buildings there. At one time, they had as many as, as 175 chickens and a cow out there. Uh, the venture only lasted a couple of years, but that got the name established as Chicken Island. And in fact, their daughter, Edna Emily Bailey was born on the island in March 1905. Unfortunately, she died at age 35 in 1940 at Ashley. So next was Native American Jack Coover. He uh, supported himself by doing odd jobs for farmers in the area, and later he operated the Mosier Ferry. And I just happened to run into this uh, bank robbery that happened in Mosier. There was a bank in Mosier, yes. And he was operating the ferry, and uh, they escaped across the river in a boat that they stole and they exchanged gunfire with him. Nobody was hurt because it was getting dark. And, but he may have been upset because the other uh, piece that I found had to have, have him had a, a robbery at his house. He came back and surprised the people, and they dropped $100 and a whole bunch of stuff they'd taken. So he may have been just a little angry about that. And here's another old photo that was followed by a tribal couple, George and Lena Orr. They sold smoked fish and made wampum. So there was an article in uh, the November uh, 1914 issue of the Hood River Glacier, which noted that he was a Modoc Indian, uh, the Upper Pitt River tribe. They called him a modern businessman. It's too tiny to read, but I'll read you just a section of it. George Orr had modernized the manufacture of Indian beads, the clipping reads in part, and his wampum has become as well known among the Indians of the Pacific Coast and Middle West as have Hood River apples become known for the fruit markets of the country. He spends a great portion of the winter months in California where he secured the raw material, which is shipped to Hood River, and then apparently he had uh, more modern techniques of making them than the very arduous, time-consuming techniques that made them so valuable in the past. And they call him a manufacturer of it. Well, he said that people would pay up to $20 for a yard of premium wampum. Now, I did the calculation. In 1914, those were gold-backed dollars. And the current equivalent is purchasing power to today's money is $600. So there's also a bit of a sad story in the connection with the island. Uh, Doris Smith will be here next week presenting a program on the pioneering Root and Evans family of Mosier found a clipping from the May, 19, uh, May 5th, 1916 issue of the Mosier Bulletin, which detailed how this couple had uh, uh, Mr. Orr's uh, sister came to visit, and she was delivered of a baby daughter, which passed away after two years, and uh, two days. And uh, she later died a week or two later from tuberculosis. And the daughter is buried on the island. You can see the, the cross over there. And now we get, and her name was Lillian Pina, by the way. We get to the most famous resident coming up. Charlie, this is a 25 year old Charles James Reether, R E I T H E R. 
Uh, as it says there, he's born in Ohio in 1882, one of nine. He came in 1908. In 1917, he convinced his brother George to file a homestead on 160 acres on the Washington side of the river, which included the island. Because you see, and that's the island which I've, you see that up, up above there, it has the um, GW Reather, that would be Charlie's brother. This goes down and covers this because, as you'll see on the next slide, the border followed the channel. And the channel at that point was between the island and the Oregon side. So it was actually in the state of Washington. Yeah. Is it still in the state of Washington? No, we're coming to that, and that's the most interesting part. <laughs> okay, and we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. But first, Charlie didn't raise chickens himself. He did have a cow. This is actually a picture of his cow. I was amazed to find that. Um, and he had, he had Timothy hay that he grew in two fields on the island. And getting the hay to the barn would be a chore. He had a barn there. It would be a chore. He could have used a wheelbarrow, but... Having been a conductor back in the day, he knew how much rails would improve the transport. So when the mines in Eastern Oregon closed in the 20s, he bought a bunch of the rails used for ore cars and set them up and had a Model T, that, this is not his Model T, uh, and actually ran it on the rims and he spaced the, 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 the Ties just far enough he could run on the ribs. He even had a switchback so he wouldn't have to turn around or go one place to the other. It was considered the shortest railroad in the U.S. <laughs> at the time. And uh, one of the, now some people said, well, that can't be because there would be a photo of it somewhere. Well, it turns out that it really was there. Now, Marilyn Goldston Shaw remembers her father having the car brought ashore in 1955. And the island's current owner, Paul Childs, confirmed in a phone call there are pieces of rail and railroad spikes still on the island to this day. So that really did take place. All right. Now, you can see, we mentioned some of the other, uh, other photos, the sandbar out here, which is pretty extensive on that. And um, when workers were building the I-84 freeway, they said, hey, this is a great source of sand, really handy to us, can we use that? And he said, no can't do that because he was afraid that would change the flow of the river and wash more of his island away. Well, <laughs> uh, that's uh, when Bonneville Dam was completed. Before that, the rising water cut the 11 acres down to the eight. So he had experience with losing. They uh, offered him $1,750 for a flowage, flowage easement and actually filed a condemnation proceeding. He settled out of court for 2,500. Good for him on that. But it was uh, below the flood of 1948 that surprised him. Um, he was awakened with water coming into his house at that point. And uh, show you, that's the flood here in the Dells. Anybody remember the old uh, buildings that burned down in the 2000 or so? And then that was the actual uh, port area right off of Union Street there at the foot of Union. So it was another uh, change in the river that affected Charlie. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers decided in the 50s that they were going to do deepen the channel and clean it up and straighten it. Well, when they did that, it ran on the other side of the, of the island and instead of being in Washington, he was now in Oregon. It's the only time Wasco County ever got bigger. <laughs> if you think about it, they chopped it down, 17 counties came out of it, including Hood River in 1908 was the last one. So uh, yeah, very interesting. But what happened is, even though he turned them down for the freeway, the construction and some of the fill they did changed the course of the river, it washed the sandbar away anyway, and it left just this little spit out here, this is to the west of the island. There is a navigational beacon on it there, and that's, that's all that's left of that. Oh, so here's where it's funny. It's an article in the Goldendale Sentinel. He was really upset about the fact that he would have been a Quinnipiac County resident, was now a Wasco County resident. Why? Because of the taxes. Check this out. That 
three dollars and one cent was his taxes for a year in Klickitat County. In Wasco County, nineteen dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> And this is 1958, folks. They also got, uh, changed the valuation of the property from $100 to $200 and increased the millage because it was in more districts than it was when it was in Minnesota. So uh, people ask what Charlie did for a living. Well, he did a bit of everything. He worked for the Port of Vancouver, Washington, uh, laying riprap for a seawall. He operated a crane and a stone quarry. Uh, he was a licensed powerboat operative and worked during the construction of Bonneville Dam. When he applied for Social Security in 1942 at age 60, he, oops, that's too much, one more there, he left he, his description as unemployed commercial fisherman. <laughs> and by the way, I wanted to point out there that this is SS form number one. <laughs> there had to be a starter form somewhere. Now there are thousands of them. Kind of interesting. I also think my own family has a slight connection with the Charlie. Uh, when I was growing up, he would send his subscriptions to Fate and Horoscope magazines to our address there at Pine Grove. And my dad would take them down to the Boatworks, which was on the on the right on the river, it made it easy when he rode down to get his mail. Now, interestingly enough. He didn't just subscribe to those two magazines, he subscribed to National Geographic and Time and Life, but he got those to the Mosier Post Office where everybody knew him. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. It's kind of, it's, as I say, kind of like uh, he had two personalities, the one he wanted people to know about and one he wasn't so sure about, I guess. And that brings us to Willis Gulston, who was Mosher's postmaster for 30 years, from 1948 to 1978, a very good friend of Charlie's, and in 1980 made a presentation here in this room, um, included a bit about Charlie, which I would like to share with you now. We'll see if this will make make this work. If uh, if it does, if it doesn't, we'll just move on. Well, it doesn't look like it's going to be. This is what the audio version of it is. Basically, he had that cow out there, and it stopped giving milk, and he didn't understand the process by which one would freshen a cow. He, he said, oh, it must have put her out the wrong time of the moon. Oh. <laughs> yeah. And Charlie, I'll come going too far there. Hmm. There we go. That's him and his rowboat. Uh, and he was a bit of a character. He was uh, concerned about the Hanfield uh, Raptors, Hanford Raptors upstream. He refused to take with water out of the Columbia. And Patrick uh, Crusoe wrote an entry on Chicken Charlie in, in the 1974 book From Akidaki to Zoomorphic, an encyclopedia about Hoover County. This is the quote. Though his arthritis was so bad he could not walk, he still rode his little boat made out of quarter-inch plywood to Mosher. There he crawled up over the rocks to fill six one-gallon water jugs with spring water to take back home. It's a tough one. So he did pass away in 1963. Uh, after noticing no lights on the island for several nights, Willis Gulston uh, visited, found Charlie uh, had gone, and Charlie's heirs offered the island to Willis in return for back taxes. Since, since he got that tax bill, he never paid a dime in taxes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the county, bless their heart, decided for so few dollars they weren't going to go after him. But they did say that if it wasn't paid within 90 days after he passed, that they were going to send it to collections. They would have had to go to the relatives, and the relatives didn't want anything to do with it. So they let him pay the back taxes, Willis did, and then uh, he gave it like a nominal $10 to each of the, of the heirs to get them all satisfied. And he had the island for, uh, I think, until 1969. So um, Also, I should remember, any of you remember the tales of Pacific Powerland with Nelson Olmsted and Clint Gruber doing the announcing? Um, I used to play that uh, three times a week at KODL and prior to that at KIHR when I worked there. They did an actual episode of about the island, and we don't have the audio for that, but I, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, Marilyn sent to me was the script for that, and one of the things it said in the script was that Charlie had lived right up to the end of his money. When he passed, they found a little coin purse that had 
$11.33, which was donated to the church in Mosher. <laughs> he had the island for several years, and then he sold it uh, for $5,000 to Dr. Robert Paul Kennedy of Pasco. Now, that doctor had the current house built in 1969, and he put a, uh, provided the power lines, which you can see the, the big uh, targets on them so that the planes don't run into them. But that's been out there since 1969. You will note that this happened before the, the uh, National Scenic Area Act passed in 1986. It would not be able to, to do that these days. Uh, let's see, where are we? Oh, the house is 1,600 square feet, two bedrooms, two baths, electric heat, septic tank, and water filtered from the Columbia. And the contractor for the island uh, was Cliff Duffy of the Dallas. And the two carpenters who did the work were Ray Hammer and uh, John Leniger's father, Bill Leniger. And she said there was tongue and groove teak on some of it. And by the way, we'll get a chance to take a close look at the house shortly. Um, we'll do a little tour at the end here. Unfortunately, Mr. Kennedy, the doctor, died before he could take possession of the home that he had built. So in 1970, his estate sold to two doctors and their spouses, Herbert and Alma Khan and Sheila and Marie Sullivan for $11,845.75. Interestingly enough, between them, the two doctors' families had 11 children. So they had many, many happy hours out on the, on the island. They were from the Tri-Cities area. And uh, when the children got a little older and weren't that interested anymore, they decided to sell it. They put it out for a million dollars. No takers on that. And I can clear up another rumor. Tom Selleck was used, rumored for years to have been interested. Never owned the island. There's a clear title in all the all Wasco County, so he never owned it. He may have looked at it, we don't know about it, but nobody's ever come for that. Then the Forest Service thought, wow. They were kind of on a, a buying spree. They bought several other islands in the Columbia after the scenic area passed. Uh, Act passed, this was actually in, uh, let's see what that, I think it's two th yeah, 2000 is when this happened. And they thought that it was going to be interesting. But Jeannie Senior wrote this wonderful article for the Oregonian in which she quoted uh, John Mabry, who was the county judge at the time, saying, that makes no sense. If you want to preserve it, it's already been classified by the Gorge Commission as the strictest uh, area of control. And it's seen by every angle. <laughs> There's no way there's going to be any development take place there. So that makes the price had dropped to 850000 by that time, but they didn't do it. Also, uh, John said, why take it off the tax rolls? If the government buys it, they were getting $5,000 a year in taxes from that, from that at that point. So, um, and after the Forest Service, four years later, 2004, they raised it to $1.4 million. But nobody bought it at that. It wasn't until 2011 that Paul and Joyce Childs uh, bought that for $774,000. And I have to give props. I had a really nice talk with Childs on the phone. He is one of the people that walks the walk. He's a physician, and he's been providing medical disaster relief in more than 70 countries over the years. And he's also an author, and he's written three books. The center one there is about uh, uh, the Holy Lady of India, something like Mother uh, Teresa. The other two are kind of um, young adult uh, books with uh, fantasies with a bit of time travel thrown in. So I thought I would share that with you. Uh, and now, let's take a tour. Here we are, debarking from our boat. And tell me if I'm going too fast, because I don't want to take too much of it. But there is a, a view from one side, and from a different angle, more on the north looking toward the south. You can see the balcony there. And this, I like this detail. And there's a view coming up later from inside looking out from the sliding glass doors over there, a little lanai. That is the living room. This is the loft as seen from the living room. And this is the loft looking down at the dining area. kitchen. And this is the view from the inside looking out from that. That'd be a lovely day. So a little bit, a couple of them from around the island. There's one view. A little bit 
more rugged aspect to it. There are also fruit trees out there. Uh, badly need a pruning, at least when this photo was taken, but they're there. And there's a wonderful little cove that's secluded and protected from the wind and is useful for boating and swimming. Now for some views of looking from the island back towards shore. If you're looking north from the island, this is what you see. And if you're looking to the west, I'm sorry, not north, that would have been east. This is looking west down the river. And this is looking right across to the south at the river. And there you are departing. And that's, that's it. Thank you, folks. I, wa I want to point out, yeah, Ben Abbott's photo, he's an amazing photographer. I have not been able to get a hold of him to get permission to use that. So I want to make sure that he got the proper. And when we find out, we'll, we'll explore that away. But thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Anybody else? Is there any time during the year where they can't get there uh, on my boat? They, they can get there pretty much any time, no, except when it's heavily stormy, they don't want to do that. They've got, they've got a boat in the marina and the river, and it's about five miles upstream from there. They, they go to the river to the yeah. island yeah. for motion. No, they, well, I don't know if there's a boat landing in the morning. steal things, uh, break windows, all kinds of stuff. And so one time he had people come and he fired at them, not hitting anybody. Uh, he was actually charged with attempted murder, but he pled it down to an $18 fine. So <laughs> <laughs> he was a good lawyer, I guess. Uh, Your father at the boat 
he would row the boat down to the boat works, park it there, and my, that's where the, the Nichols boat works was. And Dad would have, you know, he knew, he knew when the magazines would come, and then Dad would bring them down, and they'd get delivered out of Pine Grove where we lived, and then he'd take it down to the office, have it ready. Where is he buried? He's buried in Mosher Cemetery. And I, I noticed, you may have not noticed, but it had the FLT, Friendship, Love, and Truth. That's from the, the Odd Fellows. He was a 40 year Odd Fellow member in both Hood River and, and Mosher. Those two. You mentioned the, uh, the baby that was buried on the island. Is that the grave still there? That's where, the, that's where that cross is, yeah. Oh, so that was a current day photo? That was a, like maybe 20 year ago photo. But it's, that was current. Yeah, it was a color photo. Let me, I can go back to it here. Run through all this. There it is. There it is. Well, this, this was 1905. The photo is probably 20 years old. Yeah. No, no, no. That's private property posted, no trespassing. Yeah. Uh, when I talked to child, he didn't mention it but I'm sure they do. I mean, there are bozos with boats out there just like there are bozos with cars who drink and drive and do stupid things, so yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I will say that when, uh, see, I think when Willis Dolston had it a couple of times as a, a, a money raiser for various organizations, he would conduct tours for people and sign up there. And his kids have, I, Marvelous, marvelous, huge, like I say, Marilyn Wilson Shaw sent me probably 150 photos and documents. That's where a lot of the cool stuff came from. And some of them are the kids playing that one where they had the boat on the left. They had kids displaying nuts out there. What a wonderful spot. It's like a microcosm. It's got cliffs, it's, it's got the fields, it's got trees, it's got, yeah. And they said occasionally a deer will swim out to the island. And eat but no, no predators, so. Chickens would be safe. <laughs> yes. You know, if the current owner's child, uh, are they in relation to a David child? I, I asked him that. He said no. Different spelling. Different spelling, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but he's apparently one of the real good folks. He said, uh, again, this anybody who goes overseas and ministers to people as a doctor after disasters, you know, hey, it's my book. Cool guy. Where does he live now? Uh, actually, they have a ranch uh, up over in Clickitack County in Centerville, out of Centerville. So, very nice folks. Uh, I think we have some raffling to do. We do, yeah. The prizes. So, we have um, tickets here. Uh, you have to have a very small hand to reach in there. <laughs> I'd like to, uh, we'll, we'll shake them up as an ask. Anybody want to volunteer? To small hand. Pull about three of them out. <laughs> the jump one right here in the end. Yeah. I'll shake it up again and do uh, about three of them. So this would be for, um, for a coaster. And the name on that is... Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, number, uh, last uh, number is 434, 475, 434, looks like 10, 10 is it? Yes, there's a coaster. Um, next one would be for, Uh, Meryl and Ernest. Meryl and Ernest, uh, uh, she would get the silver dollar. <laughs> Marilyn, I guess, is downstairs, huh? Okay. And the uh, last one is Kathy R.L. Kathy gets the wine. Kathy, I think, is downstairs also. So uh, uh, we'll check. I think uh, the tickets go back in and they'll be uh, drawing for those other things. So uh, they, they will also be back in there for another week to draw. So uh, uh, next week, uh, Doris Smith, uh, once again, we go to Mosier. Uh, the Root Family, uh, Doris's uh, new book, and uh, we look forward to that presentation. Um, what else? Oh, coffee and uh, cookies downstairs. Uh, be sure you take a look at the new jail cell door. That's uh, something that's been added here just recently. We are much more authentic than we have been for the last, what, how many years? 76, I think, was the renovation. They, they put the wrong door on the jail. Now we have the right to run the gym. Uh, so, Roger, thank you very much. Let's yes. give him a good hand.